So um, we will collect the um, questions and um, um, comments afterwards. So we'll just um, first go and um, ask Daryl Jameson to um, speak on Jainchiku's Hollow Place, um, Encounters with the Non-Human. Okay. Okay, I think it's okay now. Please start. Okay, hi. So, uh, let's get going. Komparu Zenchiku was a No playwright, actor and theorist, and head of the Komparu School of No, which was based in Nara and associated with the Kofukuji and Kasukataisha religious complex. Though it is debatable how much influence he had in his own time, since the release of his secret writings on No in the early 20th century, he has been the focus of much fascinated scholarship by academics around the world interested in medieval Japanese art and thought. His writings, both dramatic and theoretical, exemplify one of the dominant intellectual paradigms of his age, religious syncretism. Through his connections at the Kofukuji Kasukataisha, which was the center of spiritual and worldly power in the Nara region, Zenchiku was in dialogue throughout his life with major Buddhist, Shinto, and Confucian thinkers of his day, who not only influenced his writing, but whom he asked to contribute to his writings, making his treatises, especially the Rokurin Ichiro series of 11 texts, an extremely rich meeting place of ideas. Zenchiku's deep philosophical and creative engagement with the world of ideas is, perhaps, modeled on his father-in-law and teacher Zayami's theoretical, work, theoretical works a genre Zayami inaugurated and contributed some 20 treatises to. Zayami is considered by some the preeminent no artist in history, though that assessment is of course colored by the paucity of documents relating to medieval dramatic traditions in no schools that are not by Zayami or Zenchiku. Zayami's treatises focus on the practical matters of acting, achieving success as an actor, and winning the favor of audiences in order to secure one's troops place in the uh, social order. Zenchiku, in contrast, was secure in his place as a performer in religious institutions, and his concerns are less with the social world of Kyoto and the court, and much more with the spiritual. Today, I plan to focus in particular on one of the ideas that caught Zenchiku's imagination, which is the Tendai Shingon Buddhist idea that non-sentient beings, including grasses, trees, rocks, land, and rivers, can attain Buddhahood. Zenchiku's works are famous for the number of non-human leading characters they have. For example, Basho, Kakitsubata, and Tatsuta, in which the principal characters, i.e. the shite, are the spirits of, respectively, a banana tree, an iris, and red autumn leaves, showing his recognition of the dramatic potential of this concept. Looking at the earliest of these plays, Tatsuta, I will talk about how philosophical ideas are deployed in the text and manifest in the performance. I will conclude by discussing how these ideas relate to modern philosophy as well as the idea of nature in late capitalist society. The commonly used phrase in Japanese for the concept of Buddhahood for the non-sentient is Somoku Kokudo Shikai Jobutsu, often abbreviated to Somoku, Somoku Jobutsu. Somoku Jobutsu discourse principally derives from the Lotus Sutra, the fifth chapter of which, the parable of the medicinal herbs, argues, in the words of Susan Klein, that all sentient and non-sentient beings are identical with absolute reality, and that all of nature, even wind and water, teaches the truth of the Buddhist Dharma. After studying in China, the idea is first introduced to Japan by Kukai. Though it continued to be part of the esoteric worldview, it was in the Tendai tradition that the doctrine reached its fullest theoretical expression. Its long-term presence in Tendai writings is in part related to it being one of the standard topics of debate used in educating the monks. Annan, in the late 19th century, was the first to give a systematic account of how non-sentience can become Buddhas, which later became the basis for the most detailed Tendai treatment of the topic, which can be found in the late 13th century, Kanko Ryuju. According to this Tendai encyclopedia, there are seven possible ways in which this doctrine can be explicated. These can be summarized as follows, and I've uh, summarized these from uh, Fabio Rambelli's book on the subject. Uh, the first one uh, is when a Buddha meditates on them, a plant can become the substance of the Buddha. And number two is plants are part of thusness, and thus in principle can become Buddhas, but in practice they don't. These first two are accepted by the Hoso school, which was the school uh, Kofukuji is the head temple of. Number three, 
non-dualism of environment and body, i.e. when Shakyamuni attained enlightenment, all things in the universe became enlightened, which includes non-sentient beings. This is the Kegon school understanding. Number four, each single grain of dust is in itself the substance of the Buddha, i.e. being a Buddha is equivalent to simply being. Five, innate possession of the three Buddha bodies, which can only be understood by other Buddhas. Number six, sublime and incomprehensible character of Dharma nature. And number seven, identity of the mind with the thinkable, which means that the very uttering of the words or the thought, Somukujobutsu, necessitates its being true. These last three are Shingon uh, understandings. I should say, contrary to many 20th century authors, Rambelli, uh, Fabio Rambelli makes the case that the prevalence of the Somogujobutsu discourse in medieval Japanese, Japan has little to do with innate respect for nature and more to do with a foreign system of religion justifying taking control of the land to the extent of enclosing commons and being able to dictate by whom and how trees can be cut and animals hunted in large parts of the formerly commonly held countryside. But whether this is the case or not, it is possible in the 21st century to bracket the history of the idea and engage with the idea itself. Uh, my focus is, uh, however, my focus is Zen Shiku's incorporation of this concept developed through the Heian and Kamakura eras into his aesthetic worldview in the Muromachi era, and by extension, how artists might be inspired by this now. Let's start with Zen Shiku's aesthetics of no. His most developed theory was the Rokurin Ichiro, a series of 11 texts inspired by a vision he had as a middle-aged man, refined over the course of the rest of his life. They contain his entire artistic worldview and are a remarkable snapshot of how an educated non-cleric understood the spiritual world and how it interacted with the Michi tradition. A very basic summary of the texts is that No is a sacred art passed down from the Shinto deities, who are, through Honji Suikjaku, identified with Buddhas, and the act of both performing and viewing no is a religious ritualistic experience which benefits or spiritually heals the whole world. This is a big claim, and he musters an impressively wide range of references to support it, including Confucian classics such as the Mencius, the Analects, and the Great Learning, the Kojiki, Waka anthologies, Anmyodo thinking, the Lotus Sutra, the Vila. Vimalakirti Sutra, the Ten Ox Herding Pictures, as well as Zami's treatises, among many other sources. He also had thinkers from three different traditions, a Kegon Buddhist monk, Shigyoku, a Confucian scholar, Kaneyoshi, and a Zen poet monk, uh, Nangos, Nanko Sogan, write responses to accompany his original first treatise, incorporating and building on their insights in the later versions of the text. It is a self-consciously syncretic, religious, and self-consciously complex work about ascetics designed to enhance the spiritual and intellectual standing of himself and his troop. I should say a few words about the idea of syncretism. Syncret the syncretic nature of medieval Japanese religion is often held up as a unique and laudable aspect of the culture. However, William Lafleur points out that the very existence of extensive writing, discussing and propagating the idea of Honji Suijaku that is, the centuries-long process of incorporating proto-Shinto kami worship into Buddhist worldview, is in itself a testimony to how, to how contested and therefore not inevitable, in other words, not somehow intrinsic to Japanese culture, that process was. Uh, Fabio Rambelli makes the case that far from a merger of two religions on more or less peaceful and equal terms, Honji Sujaku was in fact a hostile takeover. A, state, a central, state-supported, elite Buddhist worldview appropriating the mythology of local proto-Shinto kami worship in order to support the expropriation of land, authority, and power. However, by Zenjiku's time in the early mid-15th century, intellectually at least, it was a largely a fait accompli. In his plays and writings, Zenjiku displays a wide-ranging knowledge of the various religious traditions. However, uh, Sueki Fumihiko points out that in Zenjiku's Meishukushu, a later treatise, he makes a kind of reverse Hanji Suijaku claim that all Buddhas and Kamis are essentially Okina, the original wise old man of No, which demonstrates that the Hanji Suijaku was not a completely settled even in Zenjiku's time. 
One way in which Zhenshiku manages to more or less effectively wed together so many disparate sources in a relatively coherent text is by being, in a way that might strike some as quite postmodern, very happy to ignore the intention of the author in many quotations he uses in order to appropriate them into his own theory. This practice of appropriation and change, what Noel Pennington calls Zenchiku's creative misreading, was considered within the no community of the time standard practice. When we say Zayami and Zenchiku wrote plays, in large part what we mean is they adapted, organized, and improved already existing plays, songs, and dances into coherent or into more coherent artworks. Zenchiku is the first to apply this principle of adaptation to no treatises, but as he is also the second person to write such treatises, that's, well, that explains why that he's only the first person to do it. Okay, on to the actual plays. Uh, I want to move from Zenchiku's theory to his practice to talk about one of his early plays, Tatsuta. This play is based on one by Zayami, a play called Furu, which has never been in the standard repertory. Zenchiku's version changes a lot of details, including the all-important location, but the, play, the basic plot events follow a similar pattern. It's a god play with a female presenting deity of the autumn maple leaves, but who also represents the autumn wind and rain. In other words, not simply a tree spirit, but a spirit of all the elements that combine to make the leaves turn brilliant red. Tatsute itself is an utamakura, which is a place name, uh, symbolic of autumn leaves. In the famous words of Shotatsu, a poet from the generation before Zenjiku, Yoshino is the cherry blossom, and Tatsuta is Momiji. Uh, the waki, the, uh, sec uh, the secondary actor, unusually for a no play about a proto Shinto kami, is a Buddhist priest. And his companions, he and his companions are on a pilgrimage to bring scrolls of the Lotus Sutra to holy sites all over Japan. Tatsuta is not all is not one of these holy places, but he wants to worship at the famous Shinto shrine there as he passes by in any case. It is the 11th month of the lunar calendar, roughly December in our time, and the maple leaves in the area surrounding the shrine are bare, their fallen leaves forming a beautiful unbroken brocade on the surface of the river on which the first layer of ice has also begun to form. The monk makes to ford the river, but is stopped by a shrine maiden, the shite, who reminds him of two famous waka which warn against crossing the river when there are leaves and when there are thin ice. In both cases, the beauty of the scene would be destroyed and the holy presence angered. The shrine maiden offers to show them a different route into the shrine, visiting each of the many sanctuaries there. Then, in a reveal typical of Mugen no, the shrine maiden reveals herself to be a manifestation of the Tatsuta presence and retreats into the shrine. A local villager, the Ai Kyogen, the comic actor, comes on to explain to the priest the shrine's connection with Izanagi and Izanami's eight-lobed divine spear, the eight lobes of which reflects the eight-pointed maple leaf. Finally, in the last part, the presence returns in her divine costume to dance a Kogura dance and ascend from her possession of the main actor. Before discussing interpretation, a quick musicological note. Though this is a relatively early work, and since music performance, lacking a notation system in Zen Chiku's day, was standardized only at the beginning of the Tokugawa period, meaning we can't know how closely the music we hear now relates to what Zen Chiku would have performed himself, it is worth mentioning how re the relative lack of character development in this play, which is typical of Zen Chiku, is mirrored musically by the relative slowness of the climactic se sections. Unlike many no plays in which, through the first half, though the first half can be long and somewhat repetitive, the last section tends to be full of rhythm, dance, and relatively fast-paced singing. In other words, there's a big difference in tempo between the beginning and the end. However, in Zenchiku's final dance music here uh, is a kagura dance, specifically a Shinto form of holy dance performance, which is slow, graceful, and entrancing, but not rhythmically exciting. Just as his aesthetic treatises keep different spiritual and aesthetic traditions in harmonious balance, so too does he avoid large deviations in tempo and mood throughout the piece, maintaining tension and avoiding any resolution right to the very end of the play. The main character then, going back to the play, is a manifestation of the landscape as symbolized by the maple, seemingly pushing at the boundaries of what was accepted doctrine in the Hoso school 
The tree spirit, Tatsta Presence, whether conceived of as a tree itself or a Shinto goddess, is already enlightened and in no need of a priest. In fact, the priests, who are, after all, not offering anything other than prayers, are twice rebuffed before being shown how to enter. It seems at first that the whole premise of the play is the non-necessity of Buddhism in the Shinto place, that rather than the presence of trees, water, and wind, which are already Buddhas, it is the monks which are in need of realization, if not enlightenment. The humans can become Buddhas, but the non-sentients do not need to because they have always already been Buddhas. Mm -hmm. However, if we accept the common theory that neither the shrine maiden nor the goddess actually does appear, i.e. that the entire drama occurs only in the mind of the traveling monk, then of course his presence is, wit is the only thing that drives the drama at all. He, as a vessel of the Lotus Sutra, which contains the teaching of Soma Gujobutsu, encounters the location which, in the poetry-filled minds of medieval-educated Japanese, is actually is the Momiji, manifests the Shen and manifests the Shinto spirit of the landscape. Recalling those two poems, warning against the despoiling the beauty, manifests the image of the maiden, and reminds us, in the audience, of the power of art and memory to affect perception of conventional reality. Hearing the local villager's mythical story is enough to encounter the presence herself in his dreams and hear the Kagura music. This reading recalls the seventh, most esoteric of the seven explanations of Soma Kujobutsu, identity of the mind with the, with the thinkable, i.e. because, yes, yes, because he thinks it, he can hear it. He can see it. Um, okay, I've previously written about Ueda Shizutera's Hollow Expanse, and which is, uh, yes, yes, the place of absolute nothingness, uh, his, his articulation of the place of absolute nothingness. And uh, in that, in, okay, I'll skip a little bit about there. Yeah, 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 you have to wrap up. Uh, Sorry. Yes, I have to wrap up. up. Yes. Uh, one of the things, it's on there. Yes, yeah. In, in other words, I'll skip ahead to the conclusion of the, this, the, in other words, the Tatsta dramatizes a metonym of the Buddhist concept of nature coming face to face with the spirit of the reality of the non-human, non-sentient nature that Buddhist ideal displaced and gave cover for dispolation. Okay, uh, very quickly, that, that's a picture of the Rokunin Ichiro, uh, but I don't have time to explain it. Mm. And Yugen, uh, Zenchiku uses uh, Yugen often in uh, ka kana rather than kanji, to emphasize two different meanings, the typical meaning that zayami means, uh, aesthetic of obscurity, but also a different, with different kanji here, the hidden made manifest, which uh, aligns with Ueda's view of uh, that religion along with art can both reveal the hidden truth of our twofold being in the world. And I also believe that despite the appropriation by, medieval, by power in medieval Japan, the Soma Kujobutsu is a concept which can inspire people in the present world, um, though it was already old when Zenchigu wrote his plays starring plants. Uh, for artists today and audiences today struggling to find meaning in the art of the capitalist scene, perhaps Soma Kujobutsu and Zenchigu could be inspiring points of departure for exploring desperately needed new forms of narrative for non-anthropocentric art. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, um do we have like a microphone or okay i'm going to run up to you okay th thank you uh, all your presentations were wonderful so interesting and um, um, i've uh, got a question for carol um, the, the the whole concept of so food okay job grass if you translate it literally grass and trees with the mother from the mother nature um, but my question is just that it's only humans that can see a distinction between grass and trees. Okay, other animals probably can't. Like if, a, if an extraterrestrial gaseous light form, a light form in the nether regions of the galaxy would not be able to recognize the distinction between grass and trees. Um, is this ever an issue? Like in that seventh stage or whatever that condition uh, you, you talk about, the, the human thinking is what creates the, uh, the nature thing. Is there an awareness that this is a biological difference is a human generated thing rather than an innately occurring distinction? I 
from from what I understand about this, um, at the time, it was understood that somoku was a metonym uh, for all non-sentient things. And in fact, in China, it was. Now I'm not. I'm not going to remember the kanji, but it, it roughly, it, it roughly literally means non-sentient. It, it it doesn't it doesn't use any actual example. And in Japan. In, it was also translated in, I think, by Kukai, using the phrase somoku kokudo gareki, so using land and la, land and stones uh, and trees. And it's it's only it only became shorter over time and in the Tendai school. But so, so the idea behind it, the yeah, idea behind there are distinctions in nature that are innate, but. You, you know, you know, that's what I'm asking about. Not, not the, the, the yeah. particular example, but the, mm -hmm. not the particular metonym. As far as I know, it was understood to mean that all things were... Well, it was understood differently in different times and by different schools. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, it was understood to mean that all, all things um, were equal and that there was no... In, in terms of Buddha nature, there was no difference between humans and plants and rocks and water. Mm. All of those things were equal in terms of, the, from the perspective of the Buddhas. Okay, but you are saying all things are equal, unique things. Ah, yes. All, well. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure I can give you a satisfactory answer. Yeah, because no, no, just, uh, I'm, I'm but yeah, I, it's an interesting question, and I, I, I obviously I need to research into it a bit more of the history. But I'm, what I under, the way I understand it is that no, I, I, I don't think I can say anything more. <laughs> I don't think I can <laughs> expand on what I had. But it's a very interesting question. Uh, oh. Yeah, can I just jump in? Yeah, that? yeah, sure. Yes, you were um, mentioning it yesterday. In yes, yes. So um, you were talking about the land and um, stones and pebbles, mm. and mm. that is uh, gareki shohiki in Japanese. I mean, mm. it's, it's a translation, of course, in, yeah. from Chinese. But um, it's, it's mentioned in uh, Obakuryo, and I have been studying this with um, Suiki Sensei for this past mm. uh, year. Um, so through um, Dogen's leading, he's also um, looking at this gareki shohiki. So, of course, um, um, if you look into why this onion started, you mentioned about mm -hmm. onion, right? So why they started talking about the Buddhahood in uh, Somoku, um, he said, he, um, Sik Sensei's understanding now is because um, of the Zen uh, styles, um, Obakuryo's Karidashin. Karida, so he, um, in Zen Buddhism, there's like different levels of Kokoro, and um, there's Karidashin. Um, Karidashin is supposed to be the, the heart of the very um, heart of the nandiska, wood, which is very hard to chip in. Am I making sense? So it's, it's, it's like, um, so that's why it was translated um, as karidashin, but then that, that is a Sanskrit word. We couldn't, the Chinese and we couldn't, I mean also Japanese, couldn't find the right um, translation for karidashin. But the meaning in Sanskrit, it seems that it is um, it is kind of the heart of the tree itself. So that's why it seems that people started, especially in Japan, started to talk about the uh, somokus, um, that whether they have its Buddhahood or not. That is also um, related to the pebbles and stones, mm. gareki shoheki. So even, even the um, gareki shoheki has this Buddhahood, is the obakuryo's understanding. So that's why, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, Cooperated and um, expanded to Somoku as mm. well. So I, I'm still working with Suiki Sensei on this, but it's really interesting that. Um, so, as you mentioned, um, I think it's very anthropocentric to, <laughs> to differentiate the so and moku, the, the differentiation between grass and trees. So, I, I don't know why it came like that. Yeah, mm. But we have to you know, look, in, look further into it. Thank you so much. Yes. I'll comment. <laughs>